Hello, we have a full day here. Welcome to the 24 February 2021 Data Science Colloquium at Case Western Reserve University. Our main speaker today will be Winnie Uz. I'll start with a theoretical introduction of eight or nine minutes. My name is Mark Turner. Um, conceptual frames are thought of in cognitive science and cognitive linguistics as small bundles of knowledge organized, used to make sense of many different situations. Of course, everybody has knowledge and it's not always the same and we have variations, but conceptual frames are usually treated as bundles of knowledge that your language expects you to know. Uh, you might not know everything somebody else is know, knows, but if someone says, I need to call my stockbroker, you're likely to call up the frame for a buy-sell agreement, maybe even of securities. Now, it could be you're calling your stockbroker for a, a good recipe for apple pie, uh, but if that's what you were doing, you'd somewhat be misleading people by just using the prompt stockbroker. Uh, this falls out of the tradition of frame semantics. The biggest name here is Charles Fillmore, one of my professors while I was at Berkeley. Here's an example of the risk frame from the work of Fillmore and Atkins. When we talk about risk, there are certain slots we know in this organization of knowledge and performances that someone makes, asks us, invites us to use that knowledge we know that hasn't been mentioned in order to make sense of the communicative performance that they're giving. Here's an example of a frame provided by Han Lois, uh, a major figure in frame semantics, an example from Texas where uh, Hans lives at the University of Texas in Austin, Rick avenged the death of his pet armadillo by killing the coyote. Something like this, right? Now, the revenge frame has slots. There's the offender, the injured party, the avenger. Now the avenger and the injured party might have the same value and so on. There's the punishment. Um, uh, frame elements look something like this. And we make sense of expressions like Rick avenged the death of his pet armadillo by killing the coyote, by taking certain parts of it as prompts to be values in frame elements uh, for the frame we know without those elements have needing to be mentioned. Now, there are many ways for communicative performance to prompt for conceptual frames, gestures, emblems, co-speech gestures, paintings, architecture. Um, and uh, so this is a highly multimodal field of research. We have, it's not just words that prompt us to call up by fra frames by any means. So we have the cause motion frame and agent by, by saying we have it, I mean, if a native speaker of the language didn't seem to seem to be able to use it to make sense of expressions, we'd be very, very surprised, right? A word like throw suggests that you call it the frame for an agent performing an action on an object that makes it move in a direction. But it's not only words. If I say Bill floated the boat to me, then you don't know what Bill did. And float is not a motion verb or a cause motion verb intrinsically. On the contrary, it can be for something that's perfectly still. But you slot in to the cause motion frame because you know that noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase, prepositional phrase is a standard prompt for somebody to call up the cause motion frame and try to use it. The risk frame itself. Uh, involves frame blending. So for risk, you have not only the frames for chance, but also frames for harm. These are independent frames. There can be certain harm and there can be a chance of a benefit. But when you put chance and harm together in certain ways, you get uh, a risk frame. And we know how to call that frame up and use it. Now, if you add by blending the frame for choice, um, so someone chose to create a situ situation in which there was a chance of harm. Well, you get the difference between running a risk and taking a risk. Taking a risk is a, is a prompt 
for you to call up all of these frames as Atkins and Fillmore themselves worked on. Um, blended syntax can be a prompt for blending certain kinds of frames. So when smear um, in, is used to indicate that uh, the surface is entirely covered with something, it can take on the syntax of cover. So if I say I smeared the wall with mud, you don't think that I just put one fingerprint of mud on the wall. No, the syntax is inviting you to call up the frame of cover. Similarly, I can load the hay on the truck and it might be just one bale of hay, but if I load the truck with hay, then I'm inviting you by using this blended syntax to call up the frame for fill. So if I say I loaded the truck with hay, you're likely not to think that the truck is filled. Uh, and there's further possibilities for syntax blending. Notice that you can uh, expose your boat to the water, you can wager on a horse, and you can invest in the stock market. So if you're using the frame of risk and you want to distinguish the kind of sectors or activities in which this risk is taking place, you can blend in that syntax. So you risk your boat to the waves, you um, risk your money on a horse and you invest your money and you risk your money in the stock market. Um, frame blends are often quite pyrotechnic like this one. Uh, of course, you're not being invited to understand that the earth is metaphorically like a virion or that the virion is metaphorically like the earth. You're not supposed to understand that spikes on a virus in terms of satellites or satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit in terms of these spikes, but the global nature of the entire planet frame and the content of the virus frame are compressed together in a blend that suggests that now the pandemic concern is a global enterprise. Some of them are very funny. This is uh, French press, William McPhail, Nice to meet you right away, boss. Good morning. Yes, I'd love to see a picture of your baby. And of course, down in the ugly grounds below, we have kill, why, die, no, leave me, kill me, leave me alone, right? Now, of course, nobody thinks that, um, that, that psychology is a French press. This is extremely complicated, but you're being invited to do a frame blend. And other examples uh, like this uh, involve many blends and many frames. Um, if you want to get a taste of the humor of this, you can see Ronnie Chang giving a blend of internet watching and smoking when he says 50 years from now, we're going to think of the internet the way we think of smoking. We'll say, what were we thinking 50 years ago? Pregnant people could use the internet. We use the internet in front of babies. Babies use the internet, You're right? He's, he's gonna say, there are going to be special designated zones um, where outside of buildings 50 feet away where internet use is allowed. Don't bring the internet indoors. It's the secondhand stupidity that kills, right? A lot of humor invites these sorts of frame blends. Now, FrameNet, uh, started by Charles Fillmore, uh, Colin Baker, Mary uh, Petra, lots of other people, um, in fact, is a resource for presenting frames. There are not very many of them. We'd like to make more. And uh, Red Hen and FrameNet Brazil and Global FrameNet are trying to do that. You can tag for frames manually, but you can also do it automatically with uh, computational natural language processing. Red Hen has worked in this field. There are a lot of other people working in this field. We've cooperated with them. But you see here, for instance, an example of text that is tagged for hostile encounter because of the word quarreling, right? It's tagging it automatically. No human being touched this file. And what this means is you can say, hi, I'd like to see lots of examples, tens of thousands where a political locale has a likelihood of a weather event. Now, you might not know that a marine layer is a weather event. You might not been, have been thinking of hint 
as indicating likelihood or possibility. You might not know that Orange County is a political locale, but the natural language processing tagging for name identity recognition and for frames does know these things, has tagged it. And so it will serve up to you these sorts of examples that you couldn't have predicted because you didn't have that knowledge. See, now the question is, big field, you can research it offline. Can we do automatic tagging for frame blends? Hmm, that is a highly theoretical and complicated question that would take someone who's very skilled in uh, the humanities, but also very skilled in um, computer science. And in, where could we get such a person? Well, last year, Google Summer of Code, I described uh, a possible project, one of, I think, 18 on artificial intelligence recognition sim, um, systems for frame blends. Could we do this? And we got an application from Wen Yue Z. She calls herself Z, Susie in the United States. She's an undergraduate at Smith College. And she is a major in art history, but she's also a major in computer science and made an impassioned and highly rational appeal um, to bring together the humanities and artificial intelligence, machine learning, because it's the future. And so we selected her as a Google Summer of Code student, and she worked on this. And we now have a preliminary frame blends nomination system, which will be built on in the future by Susie and others. Susie has since uh, completing this project, um, uh, applied to go on in graduate school, and she's still waiting for various schools to uh, respond, but she already has a full merit fellowship to an elite uh, university to work in computational linguistics. She's sort of a model of data science uh, for the future. Uh, Susie is with us today, and she's going to present her system after which we'll take uh, questions. Susie, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Venus. I go by Susie. I'm happy to talk to you today. And uh, I will uh, introduce the work I have done during the summer, the frame blend nomination system, and uh, also the frame embedding method. Um, so I will share my screen. Okay. So um, this is a website that I created that documented both the result and process of my summer project. I was mentored by Professor Mark Turner and uh, we're working on uh, building a system that incorporates both algorithm recommendation and human decision in the process of uh, frame blends nomination. Um, I will begin by introduce uh, the uh, flow chart of the whole system. Okay, human in the loop frame blends nomination system. From the name, you can see it's human in the loop. That we that means we collaborate manual decision, uh, addition to the uh, algorithm recommendation, and uh, we are building this system to recommend potential frame blends cases. This is a flow chart. There is a larger circle you can see here and the smaller circle. And there are two human roles in the process, the administrator and the analyst. Administrator will be in charge of the larger cycle, while the analyst will be in charge of the smaller cycle who will make the actually manual decision. Um, so you can see this two human role. I will begin by the process of the administrator so for the mean, there are four steps and I will, they will begin with uh, deal with the algorithm. So we have a cluster of algorithm that including different kind of recommend, recommendation and uh, they can, uh, the administrator will be in charge to select the data set and also the algorithm they want to apply to the data set and run through the algorithm. Once they get the recommendation from the algorithm, they are be able to upload the result to the rapid annotator interface. So this is a decision that they need to make when they run the algorithm. And uh, they have the result. They will 
uh, do some formatting stuff and make it a spreadsheet. They can upload it into a rapid annotator interface. Um, when they work with the interface, they are required to do some setting and also in collaborate with the human analyst to do the manual decision. So they will add a new environment and uh, upload the input, which is the result from the algorithm to the environment. This is a one case sample. In the real cases for each uh, data file, we'll, of course, we will have different recommendation cases and the, each line or like each tab is a uh, case uh, recommended by the algorithm. And they can assign the work to the human analyst on the list. And uh, they do some setting stuff, like we want the label true, false, or not sure. So we assign a very near decision for human analysts who will have less knowledge about, um, about the frame blends, but so they can make a simpler decision. Now uh, the administrator can hand the work to human analysts. They will make a simple decision about whether they think this case is a frame blend or not. They will have the access to some supporting material from the website and from the group. And they will have a basic understanding about the frame net and also frame blending. So they can make their own manual judgment to the process. Uh, this is a simple interface that uh, human analysts will see. So um, they will see the actual text from the data and they can see the label created by the algorithm. Uh, here, I will elaborate the label later, but they can see some, con some contact here and they will make a manual decision, it's a very near decision about whether the thing is a frame blend or not. And the once the uh, administrator gathering all the results from the human analysts, they are allowed to append those results, those manual decision back to the uh, back to the data set. And then we'll begin a new iteration. So which means each iteration will have both the recommendation from the uh, algorithm and also human decision. Hopefully through each and each uh, more and more iteration we'll have more accurate uh, recommendation results from the whole system. And uh, I provide uh, different sporting material for different human role in the process. Uh, I will begin with the uh, administrator. I have a design document for administrator because they kind of control the overall flow and serve as an intermediary between the nomination algorithm and also rapid annotator interface. And also they are in charge of uh, contact with human analysts. Um, so this is a design document that talk about the why things in the uh, in the process is like the more conceptual and high level and uh, talk about why they need to do each step and also I have a technical guide it's like more like a how-to stuff and uh, it's put provide the actual command they need to run to uh, run the pipeline so uh, the project store in the HPC um, Red Hat lab for Red Hat lab and uh, the project is called frame blends pipeline so administrators are allowed to go to the folder of nomination algorithm and then they choose the algorithm they want to run in the process and they choose the data set they want to run. And uh, the algorithm will take care of them and um, put the result into appropriate locations. And then they can do the formatting by running the converting algorithm to convert uh, the result from the nomination algorithm to the input of rapid annotator interface. Nothing fancy here, it's just the formatting stuff, but it's important to for the rapid annotator interface have the right uh, input and uh, they do the setting. So it's all the technical sp stuff going on here. And I have another page for the analysts. Although analysts seem like having less access to the whole process, they're in charge of smaller cycling in the process, but they actually carry a super important a role in this whole system because they are the human power or human idea that we are trying to put into the human in the loop um, algorithm. Um, so I have a tutorial video for analysts that having different background knowledge just as Professor Chandler has talked earlier. And uh, I have provided uh, some additional uh, resources they can check in on as well. And uh, this is the interface they will see. Um, Another part is guide for the algorithm contributor. 
Um, so this project, this part is actually for people who will pick up this project later and uh, or someone want to simply contribute to a potential nomination algorithm. Um, currently we have five algorithms and uh, some of the algorithm are quite straightforward, like the multiple location, multiple time uh, algorithm that simply pick up the sentence that contain more than one word that represent location or time. Uh, as a recommended from the cases, because if a sentence including like including scenario across time across space as possible for instance, but some other but some other uh, algorithms are, are more complicated, like the frame vector pair and frame vector on similar uh, that's related to the frame embedding method that I will talk right now. Um, so I do have some uh, supporting material here about the. Uh, frame embedding, but it's fairly a new concept, and uh, I will use uh, the slide to present. Um, so the concept of frame embedding is borrowed from the word embedding in natural language processing. It's widely used in natural language processing, but rarely study in the frame net study. Um, so I will cover a, a basic example of word embedding. That means that words or phrase from the vocabulary are mapped into vector for real number. So it's actually break down or distract the meaning of a word into a multiple dimensional semantic space. Um, for example, in the uh, in the example here, cat, kitty, dog, and, and houses are being uh, are being deconstructed into uh, several uh, semantic parameter and. Uh, and uh, using a vector to present the meaning of those words. And we can see in this picture, uh, the cat and kitty are actually quite similar to each other. And that's kind of confirmed of our intuition. Um, it's, it's a simplified version of the word embedding, but you get the idea. And the frame embedding is similar to word embedding. Uh, it's when, when I done the project, I was thinking whether we can make the frame or understand the frame from different perspective, a more quantified um, perspective. Um, I was trying to map the semantic meaning of frame that frame in a multi-dimensional semantic space as well. And that is meaningful because that's a new approach to understand the frame and also can contribute us to understand the study of frame to frame relation. Just as this, the second example here, you can see when we map the word woman a uh, woman, man, king, and queen to a uh, semantic space. We can see the line drawn between the woman and man and the line drawn between queen and king are kind of parallel. And I found that's really interesting. And I think whether we can use that in the study of frame. Um, but how can we do that? Um, one potential approach of the frame embedding now is to calculate the average vector of all the word embedding of the little union. Uh, there is a more complicated concept here, but you can get, you can understand the little union as the word that carry the central meaning of the frame. And uh, we simply calculate the average of all the vector and use that average to represent the meaning of the frame. Uh, maybe it's not the best idea um, to present the frame, but it's straightforward and it works. Um, to better elaborate how the frame embedding can be used in the frame blends nomination process, I will elaborate on one simple algorithm called the frame vector pair algorithm. So uh, the meaning, the process is, sorry. The process is we can simply choose to frame, frame A and frame B that usually we think will create a frame blends and uh, then use the frame embedding approach which is calculating the average of like the lytical union vectors. And we can find a two cluster of frame. So the blue part, the frame cluster A is a collection of frame that have similar meaning compared to frame A. And the frame cluster B is a collection of frame that having similar meaning compared to frame B. And then we have this two cluster of frame that is similar to frame A and frame B. And then, in the data set, we can find the sentence like, including frames from both frame cluster A and frame cluster B. And that's possible also frame blend cases because frame A and frame B usually create uh, frame blends. 
So those cases will be recommended as a potential frame blends cases. So as this is the basic concept behind the frame vector, uh, frame vector pair algorithm. Um, I think about this algorithm because I think human's decision can be used in a more like efficient way rather than only do the true or false decision. So I think uh, with this method or similar method, we can better make use of the human power in the process and make a more and more accurate algorithm for the linguistic. And this is uh, this is a quick reference to the image. Yeah, I think it's pretty, mu pretty much it. And uh, feel free to ask any question. And I can also drop the link of this website on the chat and also on my email address. If you are interested to contact me, feel free to do that. Oh, want to share. Okay. So this is a link to the website and uh, Oh, this is my email address. Thank you. Uh, so I don't have any question or interest in any part of detail. I'm happy to answer. So just raise your hand folks or jump in, but Susie, <clears throat> maybe you could take a couple of minutes. You've got lots of time and say some a, a little bit more about the machine learning aspects here because uh, we have a lot of people in the audience who are experts in machine learning but a lot of people for whom the idea of machine learning is applied to frame blends is a, is a new idea right so if one you could talk a little bit about the role of what kind of machine learning happens when you have the human in the loop and the other one is since, as you know, we'd like to find other people like yourself to build upon this with you as the main mentor as, as you go into the future, uh, what you think the next steps are. At the moment, you have a system and you have a number of specific algorithms that work or try to work to pick out particular things. Is the future to build more such algorithms or in the high level design of the system, mm -hmm. are there parts that need to be modified? So that's two things, machine learning inside this actual system. And two, what, what advice would you give? Because we're gonna show this recording to all the Google Summer of Code applicants who wanna work on this in the future. What advice would you give them on the most tractable next steps for improvement? Okay. Um, I will again share my screen. So I think for machine learning, I will do want to talk more about this chart. Um, I, I have designed this flow chart because I think that's it's important for people to understand how all the workflow in the process. And I think machine learning is used in the process when we can having different iteration and also append this manual decision in the process. So the machine know exactly what human thing is a frame blend so they can generate more and more accurate result. And I do want to uh, elaborate on the label. Um, I think it's here. So uh, this, is a, this is the actual label that will be created by the algorithm. And uh, this, the number part is timestamp that represent the location of the sentence um, or the cases in the whole data file. And the FBL, FBL represent frame blends. And that's- So Susie, the, let me, let me inter slow you down just, just a little uh, for people who don't know about this. In Red Hen, we have you know 500,000 hours of recordings growing by 150 every day. And we can put any kind of recording, text, pictures of sculpture, paintings, uh, whatever, anything you can record or make an image of. Um, we can subject to Red Hen Labs tools. And Red Hen Labs tools have as one of their main functions to create metadata, that is to tag the data. 
ah, here we see this kind of frame. Here we see this kind of syntax. So we have several natural language processing taggers that work and many other sorts of things that some of them are off the shelf. Some of them Right Hand Lab has um, developed. Now, the tagging done by either the human or the machine goes into code in files in Red Hen. So this, what you're looking at, what Susie's showing you, would be a metadata file for a particular object. It might be for uh, you know, a film or an audio visual clip or something like that. And it, what it's saying here is the, the spot that we're talking about begins at the first timestamp and ends at the second timestamps. So these are pipe separated files and there's a primary tag and that primary tag could be for other things, closed caption or sentiment detection or frame, FRM, this is a frame tag, but this is a tag for a frame blend and then the algorithm that picks it out and so on. What this means is the search mechanisms in Red Hen and other kinds of things can go looking for things that have been tagged in certain ways. And these combine in a Boolean system. So you can say, as I did before, look, I want a named entity recognition that's a political locale that has a frame for likelihood and the frame for weather event. I also would like it to have uh, the syntax for cause motion and to use such and such word or something like that. And then the system instantaneously, you know, it's in computer time, finds all of these things for you. So if you have a hypothesis that things are going to work in a certain way, or they could work in a certain way, you can now, the general theoretical idea is you could now test it against vast ranges of out of sample data that were not just the anecdotal um, uh, data that you used in order to make the hypothesis. So what Susie's system does here is generate metadata inside Red Hen Lab, nominating this as a frame blend of a certain kind. And if you clicked it, it would take you right to the actual recording and show you that piece. So you could look for gestures, you could look for anything else. You could you could watch it a thousand times. Go ahead, Susie. Yeah, thank you for explanation. Yeah, so it's more like a bookmark. I can see that, and uh, uh, and with this timestamp, we can upload the recommended cases to the rapid annotator interface, no matter it's a text or a video. Um, and uh, this is a code that that actually create the, this label and as maybe helpful for people who will pick up this project later. Um, I think for the uh, suggestion for people who will do this project in the future, I will see. Um, I think it's important to know or to to explore how to make manual decision more useful in improving the algorithm. Um, because I just uh, talk about how it works in one iteration, but we do want that run into multiple iteration and we want the algorithm to be more and more accurate. That require the algorithm, the algorithm can better make use of the manual decision here. So I think that's one key point that I will recommend the, uh, the new people to do. And another part I will say, um, I recommend it to explore other possible new methods to recommend the frame blend cases and also building up on the frame embedding method because uh, currently I only use uh, calculating the mean value and uh, that may be not the best way. Although that work in some, in, in, some, in some perspective, but I guess it will be definitely a better approach to do that. And I think that's a bit, will be a really interesting field as well. Um, I want to share uh, some uh, supporting resources in the process when I'm done this project. So this is uh, this is my uh, documentation of the process. It's more like a diary, and I document all the meeting we have and all the paper that has been used in the process. And it's all hyperlinked. You can just click on it, and uh, it's all the notes of uh, all the meetings. And also, I provide the meeting slides uh, on this page. Uh, I also having the 
a GitHub repo of the code. So I think that's will be useful. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, all. That. Su Su Susie, Justin Barber has a lot of terrific questions and I'd like to invite Justin, if he likes to turn on his uh, microphone and ask them. Sure, please. Yes, Susie, this is great, thank you. Uh, and feel free to ignore any of these, but first of all, what sort of data set did you use to test this model? Uh, I use the data set from the right hand lab. Like it's a data set. Um, it's like the, I think we, we have the newspaper and different media that from right hand lab. Yeah, right hand lab. If you go to righthandlab.org, you can see a description of the data set. Um, although we can put any kind of recording into Red Hen, as long as you've got any, any digital recording of anything into Red Hen, if you've got it, uh, the largest um, sector in Red Hen is television uh, news broadcasts, where by news, we, we, it means soft news as well. That includes things like talk shows and interviews and late night comedy where in, in is section 108 of the US Copyright Act covers us for anything where people are basically talking about current events. We can't sell it, but we can use it for research and make it available to researchers and so on. At, at, there's a description on the Red Hen site, but roughly um, there's a, a ton of audio, about 500,000 hours of recordings, about 5 billion words, it's, it's, it's truly immense, but you shouldn't think of it as really a repository. Red Hen is a set of tools and anywhere there's a set of recordings, we can network to that and apply the Red Hen tools to whatever archive or holding people have. Sometimes we actually ingest it into Red Hen, sometimes we just uh, connect to it, but Susie had available to her, um, you know, 5 billion words in, uh, many, many languages, English, French, Spanish, Italian, Hungarian, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, uh, Port European Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, Chinese, Mandarin, uh, and on and on and on and on. We, we capture worldwide and, um, you know, we're, we began as linguists, so naturally we tend to have, be interested in language uh, despite the fact that human communicative performance is multimodal. So we really try to work in that direction too. But this means we, we want closed captions, we want text, we want the actual speech, and we want people to be able to see the actual human performance or rather the recording of the human performance. If you run across anything that's communicative, the deal in Red Hen is that you can click on it and then you can actually watch the human performance uh, in real time and continue to analyze it. So Susie's, this, you can see if, if we're all looking at, you know, five pages, we can probably pick out the frame blends, right? Mm -hmm. If we're looking at 5 billion words in 500,000 hours, it's, it, forget it. It's just, this is completely intractable. So if you wanna make predictions and find patterns and things like that, you need some help. The human being will never be replaced, as you know, Justin, but this is a, an attempt to make the human analyst's job 20 times easier. So, yeah. so go, that's, yeah. that's great. Thanks, Mark. Susie, you were gonna say any more, sorry. No, uh, no, no, please. I, let's, let's get into the details here. You've okay. got these questions about- uh, Thank you, yes. Uh, yeah, so since word embedding is, uh, I mean, they generally average together the different uses of the word. So if a word is used in five different ways, they all become sort of a single vector. And mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if you thought about exploring any other, you know, including any other attributes of words or terms or phrases, such as part of speech or anything like that. Yeah, I would think about that because that depends on like the, the, the structure of the frame net frame. There are different vectors we can take into consideration when we do the frame embedding. Um, I was currently use that code union because um, that's, I think that's carry the major meaning of the frame, but definitely I think the other factors such as the frame element and other, uh, other a uh, parameter in the frame can be used in the frame embedding. And uh, I, I think also the calculating the average is not the best way. I know that, but 
that require a more sophisticated algorithm to decide what the attention is for like each parameter. And I think that's also super important. Um, I think another question. I think the frame embedding is different from word embedding because that incorporate both the natural language processing method and also the study of frame net. Uh, I think frame frame nets understanding the language in a different per perspective compared to natural language processing and then using frame embedding, we can having the best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Colin, right, uh, you seem to be with it. Colin Baker is of course a principal of uh, FrameNet at the International Computer Science Institute and um, uh, extremely well known to anyone who works in conceptual frames, uh, worked under Charles Fillmore, of course. Colin, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I put it in the chat, but I'll ask yeah. it in person. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered, in addition to the frames and knowing which lexical units are in which frame, I wondered if you use any of the other information from FrameNet, uh, the information in the annotated sentences, which are not available for every LU, but there are usually at least some in every frame. Uh, and in particular, uh, the syntactic information. So when we annotate the sentence, we are also providing some syntactic information about how the words fit together around the LU, around the lexical unit. Now, have you tried or have you considered using any of that kind of information? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I haven't used other factor other than the the co union, but I I do think about it, and I think frame element will be helpful in the process. And the, a lot of parameter can be used in a proper way to do the frame embedding, but I think that require a lot of mathematics or more sophisticated algorithm to decide what weight you want to give in, in different. Um, different parameters, since we do want to break this down to a simple vector. Um, yeah. Yeah, Colin, I, I would say that Chago Torrent, who is also among the participants, brought this up when um, uh, late in the game, when we were uh, thinking about improvements, he pointed out the syntactic information often connected to certain frames and that this would be uh, a, a path for improving the, um, uh, the quality of the frame embedding detection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about your example of different prepositions. Yeah. They're representing different kinds of frame blends, so it would be worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I should, I should say that uh, this was an extremely ambitious project, as you can see uh, on Susie's part, and we warned everybody uh, still lots of people wanted to get uh, involved with it, e exactly because th th there wasn't anything in the data science world um, that approached this, really. I mean, we've often published lots of papers in cognitive linguistics and multimodal analysis about frame blends. In fact, this paper of mine that I cite called Frame Blends was uh, delivered in Bologna, uh, Chuck Fillmore gave the first talk and I gave the second one. Uh, so it's in the, and there's a book, you can go have a look at this kind of thing. So the, one of the issues that we have in data science is how to take these, this rich theoretical knowledge in the humanities and the social sciences and connect it with computational and statistical techniques to help the human analyst, right? It's a, you know, Lagrange said that Napier doubled the life of the astronomer by inventing logarithms because now you could add instead of multiply and it was much more reliable and it was a lot quicker. Well, so what we're trying to do is get logarithms for those of us who work in the humanities and the social sciences, right? Can we use these computational approaches to make the job of the human analyst uh, uh, of the human analyst easier, and um, uh, Susie, uh, with, with great bravery, uh, submitted a proposal, and we worked with her on it, and she and she went forward. 
And we, uh, as I say, we now have a system that actually, it's not just proof of concept, it's in the pipeline, it tags. And the reason it's called a nomination system instead of a recommender system is you're still going to have to have the human being uh, knocking out false positives and false negatives to some extent. That's exactly what's uh, going to be needed. Um, and this kind of thing arises all the time. So when we have people looking for gestures in all of this data, one of the first things they asked for was, listen, could you, could you give us a computer vision algorithm that would show us whether or not there's actually a human being on the screen? Because half of the time we look at this and it's off screen or it's voiceover or there are no, I mean, it, so we're look, half of what we look at, we never should have looked at to begin with, right? Sure, that's easy. So you just knock out half of them because there's no person there, right? Um, and Susie understands all this and is pushing uh, it forward. What I wanna say is, um, before we go to Justin, you know, in the humanities, I mean, well, you know this, Colin, you've been building FrameNet for a long time. In the humanities, there are a lot of people with very specific knowledge. So there's Amy Cook, who knows an awful lot about Shakespeare. But we might also imagine somebody from classical antiquity, uh, Anna Wilson uh, and, and political discourse in Russia, someone who works on fifth century Germanic tribes. And they know that those communities had certain kinds of frames, like say the Weir Guild, which is the price for killing a man. Very, very complicated, right? It doesn't mean, hi, I kill, I kill you and now I pay this to your money. But, but everybody had that frame or rather the language expected you to. Well, when you're reading these texts and looking at things, if you happen to have an absolute expert right in your ear who can always explain to you everything that's going on, well, fine. But if you don't, can you have a system uh, and this was actually described by John Barth uh, as a hypertextual book. You can also see it in Douglas Adams' Checker's Guide to the Galaxy, where there's the book, and you click on something, and it suddenly starts talking to you and explaining to you, well, the Weir Guild was... Okay, so could, could we have people in the humanities um, and the social sciences create systems of frames that are specific to, or characteristic of certain kinds of communities so that all of those texts and all those performances, all those plays could have behind them frame tagging um, to share with you knowledge, to share with the reader knowledge that, the, that the, even a pretty good reader might not have, right? Um, pushing this kind of uh, connection of the humanities and data science forward is not very easy, partly for sociology. And one of the great things about Susie's application was it was fully conversant with the humanities and fully conversant with the cognitive science. So that was the one we looked for. Justin, you have another question. Thank you, yes. Uh, so Tim Beal, Michael Hemingway, myself, and Mark DeCrean are currently following in your footsteps, Susie, um, and sort of trying to see if we can do something similar. and. I'm just curious, after you've, you've done all this work, if you would have any intuition about what you would try next, if you were trying to automate this process um, of finding frames in, in language, uh, do you have any intuition about what other sorts of models you might try or anything along those lines, beyond what you've said? Mm, I think I, will, I do want to do more exploration about the frame embedding, because I think that can provide a new perspective, understand the frame, and also understand the frame to frame relation. And the, the work I have done is not good enough. It's like not, not the best way to present the frame embedding. And I believe there is more potential in frame embedding. So I guess I do want to try more things about uh, having the optimal frame embedding methods. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Justin, just let me say that uh, Red Hen Lab has applied to do Google Summer of Code again. So we've had an award six years in a row, uh, which kind of surprises us because we were told at the beginning that usually organizations cycle out after about three years because you've got your start and you don't need any more help. 
Um, but we're one of the very few in the world that are in, hello, Andrew, that are in humanities and social sciences, right? Most of the applications to Google, or most of the organizations that want to work with Google Summer of Code are, are working on, you know, pandemics or plate tectonics or astrophysics or materials engineering or something like that. Whereas we do multimodal communication, but we have posted this very project as a potential project for further work by further students with Susie as the mentor. And if uh, you can communicate with me offline, I'd be very happy to share with you and the Colorado team uh, proposals that we get um, to work in this area or similar areas to see whether or not some of this international network of students um, could benefit from, or you know, it would be symbiotic, and you could benefit from uh, uh, these sorts of people. If you if you'd like to talk about, you know, hooking up in that way, please let me know. Thank you, Mark. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Sure. Um, Tim Beale asks, but he can ask it himself. He wonders if um, these techniques could be applied, Susie, to metaphor embedding. What do you think? I think that's possible. Like if we can also trying to break down um, the meaning of metaphor, but I guess it's kind of different layer. I don't know. I, I think it's possible, but I just cannot think of intuitive uh, approach right now. Yeah, Tim. So as as you know, uh, frame blends are sometimes metaphoric. Mm -hmm. So th this system should pick up an awful lot of what one might call metaphor embeddings. So, for instance, uh, you know, I showed you it's going global and the Earth is blended with the virus, not metaphorically. You're not supposed to understand the earth in terms of a virus, you know, a virion, right? That's, that's not how that's working. But um, there are blends, uh, quite complicated ones that everybody feels are metaphoric. So if I say you're digging your own financial grave, it's, it's immensely complicated because of course, it's not the case that grave diggers don't know that they're digging a grave. In the target, the person who's investing is the one who's ignorant. And so the main framing of the blend actually comes from the target, not from the source. But it still feels metaphoric for various reasons. Yeah. And uh, we sort of the relationship between blending and metaphoric products is, as you know, a huge theoretical uh, sector. And it's a sector that Susie runs up against all the time. Yeah, it, it just straight. I was, I was thinking about the you know the overlap between metaphor and blending that's often there, and also and also that in both cases, you you've got you're trying to think about embeddings with regard to either pairs or groups of words in context, and whether you know I'm just thinking about the different ways you can kind of approach doing embeddings with that. Whether it's you with a metaphor, you do I forget the the technical term for the two parts of a metaphor all of a sudden. But anyway, you could do embeddings of each of those and somehow develop some kind of correlation between them, an embedding of the correlation or something like that. Or it could be that you are looking at embedding word embeddings for a word when it's in the context um, that makes it clear that it is um, you know, being used as a metaphor. I'm just thinking out loud. This is the first time I've thought about it, but this is a great uh, you, part of what your your great project is doing, Susie, is is raising all kinds of interesting questions for for other kinds of, of product projects like this. So I appreciate. Yeah, it. thank you. Uh, I do have a comment. Uh, I think when I think about the method of frame embedding, uh, I was trying to figure out what's the best way to make humans' uh, decision more efficient in the process of recommendation. So I think if we only use human to mark the true or false, it will be less efficient. So we do want human to provide more information to make the system more accurate. So I was thinking about whether we can let human to provide a sample frame blend cases and use a word embedding method to found a cluster of similar 
frame uh, frame uh, blends cases in the larger data set. I think that also apply to metaphor. You can find two cases, uh, two frame in a sentence that you think that create a metaphor and using the frame embedding to from the other cases that contain frame from that to cluster as well. Yes. Amy, would you like to ask your question? Sure, I'm trying to find a way to uh, ask questions. Doesn't reveal me as completely a, a newbie, but um, I guess my question is, if you found a particular example of um, a, a, a frame embedding, a, a blended frame embedding, um, in a particular phrase, could you then search the database for that for usages of that phrase or a key sort of, you know, um, operative element of that phrase to see if there are correlating gestures? I'm wondering if there's um, if there's ways to to go from um, the algorithm that's going to help you sort of isolate these frames or these blends um, to how we use performance to signal to, to, to potentially um, signal or help um, guide the listener to to take our um, our blend or not. Mm, uh, do you mean what how uh, the user can make use of the recommendation from the algorithms or no so I'm thinking so if you think about the um, the, the virus going global idea um, mm -hmm. um, is might if you if you were to look at um, X going global um, mm -hmm. as as a as an idea across the um, the massive data mm -hmm. um, do you see are people more likely to gesture around going or global or the thing like what is there something that people find that, that is most likely to um, invite the gesture. This is a this is a standard red hint question. I'll cover I'll cover this one. All over the world, we have people who would like to investigate gesture. Now, people have been working on language and syntax and frames forever, and uh, they're we're at a certain state of the art, but. Automatic detection of gesture is only just beginning. It's only in, like in the last few years. Open systems of open pose and so on. If you look at the Red Hint site and Google Summer of Code, we have lots of uh, pro possible projects in that area. Um, so, for, but let's just walk, break it down. If the frame blend nomination systems said, hey, I think these are frame blends. In, if they come from audio material or audio visual material that Red Hen is tagged, then you can see it. You could at least see it. It might not automatically pick out the gesture for you, but you could look at it and you could play it again and again and again and again, because sometimes these gestures are themselves blends of gestures and extremely complicated. That's why you throw them into a lot and do them frame by frame. And in fact, we did a paper, Peter Eric, with Ham, uh, me, Irene Metalberg, on gestures for existential there. Like, um, you know, there are resources available. I'm not telling you where they are. I'm just telling you that they exist. Where do you get the gesture in the existential there clause? Um, uh, so that's that kind of thing is available. And that's done by using the detection of the language to go hunt for the gesture. However, for about three and a half years, we've been working on automatic detection of gestures. We did one of the very earliest of them. Uh, 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 a master's student said Case, um, uh, who's now at Google, worked under Professor Shumi Ray and me on timeline detection. So like from inception to completion, uh, from inception to complete, from start to finish, right? That kind of thing. And we had a lot of manual taggers in Spain under Cristobal Pagan Canovas and Javier Valenzuela and Inés Olza, and they marked them. And then the machine learning developed a system. It's, it's, it's never perfect, of course, developed a system to tag for timeline gestures. Now that we have systems like Open Pose, which are after the ones that uh, Red Hen worked on, we're trying to use the, those. So I should say that we are um, very actively 
trying to develop, you know, sort of from scratch, uh, gesture detection. So uh, Chago has, uh, Torrent has sent a paper on um, automatic paper metaphor detection. And so the idea, Amy, is something like uh, Susie's system would, of course, clue the human analyst into good places to look to see. So if you found, you know, 5,000 frame blends of a very certain specific kind, you could turn your students loose on tagging them in Elon. But if you actually had a data set that big and that good and you had a human in the loop, then we might be able to give that data set as a training set to someone who wants to release TensorFlow or some kind of machine learning system on it and produce an automatic tagger. Again, not with the idea that it would be as good as the human being, but it can work in super fast time all night long and accomplish amazing things and then nominate to the human being what it thinks is, uh, is, is going on. Susie, did you have something to add to that? No, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah. So folks, any other questions? That, that, that looks like a wrap, Susie. Thanks so much. We all wish you the best in your uh, graduate work. We're all very uh, excited and we ho hope you'll um, keep everybody posted and update uh, your, your project page. And of course, you and I are likely to see each other in the future as the mentoring team for the next yeah. steps in uh, this project, where largely you'll do all the work and I'll just smile because it's done so well. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.